Hello and welcome back to a brand new episode of the Joel Moran Show. The NBA season is coming back. And because of that, I got to talk about the NBA. I was thinking about this the other night. You guys know if you've been following the show, you've been watching the show, I appreciate you, by the way, if you have, that I have been covering college football on Saturdays, waiting for the games to end, and then coming on live, talking to you guys, giving my reaction on a college football day. But here is a problem with that. While I know I can get into football, into college football specifically because I'm already into football with the NFL, I know I can get into college football, but is that something that I'm actually really passionate about? The answer to that question was no. And I don't want to shortchange you guys, the audience, in my analysis when I come up here. I'm not somebody that's an expert on the transfer portal. I don't know a ton about college football. So me, I'd rather stick to my roots, the NFL and the NBA. So going forward, what the Joel Moran show schedule will be is that I will be doing a show on Monday and Thursday nights. Whether they get posted Monday or Thursday nights, who knows? Sometimes it'll be at night. Sometimes it'll be in the morning. Then Saturday, I will do an NBA centered show, bringing on John Tortorelli and might sprinkle in some NFL. But for the most part, it is going to be NBA, especially with the regular season, in-season tournament. I believe those games will be on the weekend, on the Saturday. After that Saturday, recapping those games on the Joel Moran Show. So that's what's going to happen moving forward. I want to touch on this Joe Cronin thing first, though. Joe Cronin told Dame that there was no coming back. Let's just recap this entire Lillard Blazers trade fiasco. The timeline of it. July 1st, Dame requests a trade to the Miami Heat. Joe Cronin told Dame if that's the case, he's going to go after every attractable asset that the Heat have. Now, what does Joe Cronin mean when he says that? What Joe Cronin means is you're not getting traded to the Heat unless they give up everything. And obviously, once Cronin says that, Dame already kind of has an assumption that I'm probably not going here because my management, my general manager, refuses to do business with the Heat. Since the trade request that happened July 1st, the Blazers had refused to engage with the Miami Heat. The Heat said that there were never legitimate negotiations, and I can understand that. Lillard said he would he would rescind the trade request if he couldn't get traded to the Heat, and that's when Cronin said, there was no coming back. I'm going to respond to this in two ways. I think a lot of the times when we react to things that are said, that are reported, oftentimes we react to it in an emotional way, the human way, but we never talk about the actual business side of things. So on this show and attacking this topic, I want to touch this topic in two ways. The emotional way, how I'm feeling about it, how I feel how, how I feel for Dame, and also the business side. So let's talk about the emotional one first. This is beyond disrespectful. For Joe Cronin to say this to Dame, there is no coming back after he's been with the organization for 11 seasons, made the playoffs eight times, won playoff series, made a Western Conference Finals in 2019, has been your franchise star your main attraction, if he says he wants to come back and you just deny him entry, that's disrespectful. That's foul. And I feel for Dame because Portland is his city. Dame only wanting Miami ruined a ton of leverage in negotiations for the Blazers. But instead of letting the Heat take advantage of the situation, Cronin was hell-bent on denying the Heat of any trade talks that were legitimate. Instead, they let the Bucks take advantage of the situation. They, meaning the Blazers, Joe Cronin. The Blazers got one first-round pick in 2029 for Dame, two pick swaps, DeAndre Ian and Drew Holiday, who they can trade Drew Holiday, get something back. Dame went for one first round pick and two pick swaps. Rudy Gobert went for four first round picks. 
Donovan Mitchell went for three first round picks and a pick swap, if I'm not mistaken, or it might have been four first round picks. Neither here or there. You understand what I'm saying. Dame is better than Gobert and Donovan Mitchell. And the Jazz got a much better return on their stars than the Blazers did for theirs. And a big reason for that is Joe Cronin's stubbornness. And to that, I say, way to go, Cronin. Way to show Dame, really. You didn't trade him to the Miami Heat. Instead, you traded him to the Milwaukee Bucks. Oh, man. Dame must be crying. He is in misery. You just traded him to the now title favorites. Wow. You really showed Dame. You really showed Dame. Good job. There's no doubt in my mind the Blazers could have gotten a better package for Dame. I think they could have gotten a better package from Miami for Dame. Some will say DeAndre Ayn is a great young center. I don't believe that, and I don't think you do either. He lacks motor and effort. Will he put up great numbers in Portland? Yes. They're going to be empty stats. We've seen him in the last two playoffs show no effort, no heart. Give me a break. Drew Holiday, can he be traded? Yes. There are a multitude of teams that would want Drew Holiday. What will they get back? Don't know yet. With the Heat, Tyler Hero was going to be the main player in the package, but he was going to be sent to Brooklyn. Ben Simmons to Portland. And I'm sure the Blazers would have gotten more picks from the Heat than they did from the Bucks. Joe Cronin only traded Dame to the Bucks to show him a lesson. That I run this organization, not you, the player. I'm going to send you where I want to send you. You want the heat? Uh, too bad. You're going to the Bucks Because I don't want to give you what you want, even if it might be a better offer. The good news in all this is that while Dame didn't deserve that response, he deserved more respect. He got traded. You can say to the better team. While I think it didn't matter, if the Heat got Dame, they would have been favorites in the East. If the Bucks got Dame, we know right now they're favored to win the championship, the whole thing, by Vegas. It didn't matter either or. But Dame still got a great situation. He gets to compete for a championship. But Joe Cronin, okay, you didn't let the Heat take advantage of you. You let the Bucks take advantage of you, though. You traded a superstar, a top 10 player in the NBA, for something that is not what a top 10 player should be traded for. What did the Nets get for Kevin Durant? And I understand that Kevin Durant is a better player than Dame, and he plays a position that's more valuable Dame than Dame and more needed than Dame. But KD, K- KD got the Nets, Cameron Johnson, Mikael Bridges, and four first-round picks and, and a bunch of pick swaps. And the Blazers only got one first-rounder for Dame? Are you kidding me? It's stubbornness on the part of Cronin. And I feel for Dame, that's the emotional side. He didn't deserve that. He's brought great moments to the city of Portland. And for Joe Cronin to say, there is no coming back, what you mean there's no coming back? This is Dame City. The city respects Dame more than you. I thought it was flat out disrespectful. Now that's the emotional side. The business, logical side, of me poses this question to all of you. Was there going back? Was Joe Cronin blunt and upfront about what he said to Dame? Yes. Was he right? That's for you to decide. Was there coming back? Dame had already requested a trade. We know this franchise isn't competing anytime soon. At media day, what is Dame going to be asked about? Leaving Portland. After every loss the Blazers get, what is Dame going to be asked about? Leaving Portland. What does Dame's presence on the team starting and playing 38 to 40 minutes a night do for the growth of the Blazers' third overall pick and Scoot Henderson, for the growth of Shaden Sharp, for the growth of Anthony Simons? It hurts them. Would Dame be a great mentor? No doubt. 
But in the NBA, you need reps. And these players would have not gotten the amount of reps they're going to get now had Dame of stayed. So what Cronin said to Dame is kind of the equivalent of you made your bed, you now lay in it. You requested a trade. You were the one that only picked Miami and wanted to go nowhere else. You held the organization hostage. I'm just reciprocating that energy. You tell me I have to trade you to this one place. I run this organization. I make the decisions. You don't make them. I'm going to show you just how much you don't make them. And that's why Cronin didn't engage in talks with the Miami Heat. After this whole trade request fiasco has been leveraged against the Blazers, you got to ask, is that good business on the part of Dame? Dame can blame the organization all he wants, saying that they gave him false promises of trying to build a true contender around him. But we all watch basketball. We know where the Blazers were trending for years now. Dame, I think, knew it too. Let's not act like the Blazers didn't give Dame nothing. Dame is set for life. The Blazers gave Dame a boatload of money, set him up for life. Did Dame earn that? Yes. But the Blazers had to dish it out. The Blazers gave him that supermax. The response was direct and blunt. It came across as heartless, sure. But it's business. The NBA is a business. The organization has to do the best for them. The player also has to do the best for them. I think one party in this understands it's a business. The front office, from the beginning of time in the NBA, has understood it's a business. The players always seem to be caught by surprise when they learn it's a business. That can't happen moving forward. Moving forward, players got to play the same game. And some players have been playing it. The one that I think of that comes at the top of my head is LeBron James. In his prom, he was signing two-year contracts so he could always leave whenever he wanted if the situation wasn't right. Giannis, he showed us it's a business. Going on podcasts, saying if Milwaukee doesn't put me in a position to win, I'm not staying. That was a business move by Giannis. While I can understand the emotional side of this fiasco and how it comes across telling Dame, the franchise star, there is no coming back. It's heartless. It's disrespectful. But when you ask yourself the question and answer it, was there coming back, though? Was there coming back for Dame in Portland? After the request, after not being traded, having another losing season. What was there to come back to? It's a business. Before I get off this microphone and off this show and finish this show off, I want to talk about the Lions beating the Packers 34 to 20. The Lions are three and one on the season. The Packers dropped to two and two. This is the Lions best start since 2017 when they had Jim Caldwell and Matthew Stafford as a head coach. I mean, Jim Call was a head coach, Matthew Stafford is a quarterback. The Lions have won six straight division games. It's a new era for Detroit, and I'm happy for them. Before the season, I picked the Packers to win the division. I had the Lions at nine wins. I I still had them as a plus 500 team. My main concerns for the Lions was just how good this defense was going to be. Was the win streak at the end of the season a fluke, or was it foreshadowing what was to come for the Lions? Well, four games into the season, it looks like what the Lions were in the second half of the season of last year, they're that this year and then some. Oh, yeah. The Lions defense was the story of this game. We know the rushing attack is always going to be there. They had 200 plus rushing yards on the ground. But this Lions defense, last week it held Atlanta's rushing offense. Who Atlanta runs on everybody. Couldn't run on Detroit. In this game, The Lions held the Packers to 27 rushing yards. Jordan Love was pressured on half of his dropbacks. 
the Lions barely blitzed. It's hard to play quarterback in this league when pressure is in your face. The defense is only rushing four, and you got to face seven in coverage. Because at the end of the day, there's only four receivers and there's seven defenders back there. It's very hard to play quarterback when the defense co consistently has a numbers advantage. The past two games, the Lions have had three takeaways, 12 sacks, seven for 25, third down conversion rate. They have only allowed 20, they only allowed 27 rushing yards on the day versus the Packers and stopped the Russian and, st and stopped the Falcons rushing offense. I had my concerns about this defense, but I was proved wrong. It's as simple as that. It's been one of the best rushing defenses in the entire NFL. And when you take out a major component of a team's offense, that other component becomes much harder to do. If you take out the Packers rushing attack, now Jordan Love at home in prom time behind a bad offensive line has to throw his throw the Packers into the game. Last week, you stopped the Falcons rushing offense. Now you're forcing Desmond Redder to beat you. This is how you win in the NFL. The offense I mentioned had 211 rushing yards. This Lions team is a team that can play defense, that can rush the football, they're elite in the trenches, and they can pass as well. Jared Goff is a good quarterback, Amon Ra is a great receiver, and Sam Laporta is a great tight end, even as a rookie. And Jameer Gibbs has yet to be unleashed yet, but David Montgomery is doing more than a fine job right now, and he's really showing out for the Lions. A team that is successful in all these phases, not only is a playoff team, but is a team that can win in the playoffs. If the Lions make the playoffs, which they're on track to do, I could see them winning the playoff game. They're that good. This offense hasn't even clicked all the way yet. The defense has been the major reason why they've been winning these games. And last year in the first half of the season, the offense was the one that was getting into shootouts. The defense couldn't get stops to win the Lions the game. My major takeaway from this game, Lions and Packers, is that the Lions understand who they are. They understand their identity. Dan Campbell has instilled a culture of toughness into this team. This is a team that is going to beat you up on up front on the offensive and defensive line. They're going to run down your throats. They're going to pass the ball efficiently. And with all those things combined, you get a goddamn good football team. With the Packers, they're still finding their way. Jordan Love is a first-time starter at quarterback. He, he's only started five career games. The receiving core is the youngest in the NFL. The offensive line is hobbled. The defense has some injuries. The Packers don't understand what their identity is. The Lions do. And I think that's the major takeaway that I got from this game. And it, it makes sense. The timelines line up perfectly. The Lions have had Dan Campbell for three seasons. This is his third season. Each year, we've seen signs of the Lions getting better, playing tougher, playing harder, gotten better at their weaknesses. In their third year, it's all coming together. They just had a fantastic draft class. Jared Goff looks like a much better quarterback than he was back in the Rams. Everything is clicking for the Lions. They understand who they are. For the Packers, it's their first year in the Jordan Love era after Aaron Rodgers. It's going to take some time. There's going to be bumps and inconsistencies in the road. But ultimately, if you're a Packers fan, you hang your head on this. The offense is young, but man, they have shown some serious flashes. Jordan Love, through the first four games, has 10 total touchdowns to three interceptions. Still a fantastic start. And although this game versus the Lions wasn't good, it was ugly, he completed 64% of his passes. In his first three games, he was at 55%, I think, below that. So it's a good sign he's completed more passes. And I think when you get Jordan Love in rhythm, he gains confidence and he's more accurate on these throws. But a lot of the inaccuracies have been, you know, the Packers taking deep shots, but also miscommunications between Jordan Love and these young receivers on the outside. And for the Lions, if you're a Lions fan, you got to be proud and happy to be a fan of this team right now. And I'm happy watching them for you guys because this team, I think, represents the city of Detroit. Dan Campbell has done such a tremendous job coming here and changing this culture. 
And it seems like a shift is happening, and I'm buying into the shift that is happening. Right now, the Lions proved that they are the best team in the NF NFC North. They beat the Chiefs week one, opening day of the NFL. They're showing everybody when they get in a primetime stage that we are the real deal. We are not just the story. We are a great football team. And if you're a Lions fan, you got to be super ecstatic about how tough and how hard this team plays. It's truly one of the more fun teams to watch in the NFL on a week-to-week -week basis. The last time the Lions won a playoff game was 1991 with Barry Sanders. Hopefully this year it could change because Lions fans, you guys deserve it. That's going to do it for this episode of the Joel Moran show. Next episode will be on Saturday with John Tortorelli. Going to talk about some basketball, going to talk about some trending topics in the NBA. It might sprinkle in some NFL, but that's going to do it for me tonight. I'm recording this at 121 in the morning, but it will be out in the morning for you guys tomorrow, Friday morning. So hope you guys enjoyed this video. If you liked it, make sure to leave a like, subscribe to the channel, and I'll see you guys next time.